Hello, and welcome to another episode, episode three of Lens of Reflective Leadership. It is Monday night. Um, We're going to dive into chapter two of the Dr. D book. But first, we had teachers back today. So we we just came off of a break, hence the nice, I look exhausted (laughs) because I didn't sleep last night look. Um, But we're doing it. I'm going to persevere. Um, And we're going to make sure we talk. So great to see your staff today. It was. And I really had thought about, um, as I reviewed the book this morning and looked at this chapter again, I really thought about that piece of connections. And I know, um, I'm sure, um, like you did today, one of the best parts of my day was just going to each teacher's classroom individually, um, talking to them, Mm -hmm. making a quick connection, learning about their break. Um, doing that kind of mental filter of their brain state, maybe some of the experiences, if they chose to share them with me over break, happy mm-hmm. and maybe um, not as happy, depending on the situation for the individuals Absolutely. that I can use to make connections with them later on. It yeah. really is. You forget how energizing and amazing teachers are until you have the opportunity to be with them again in the building. And so, yeah, it was good. Did you get, you got to do all your check-ins today? Yeah. And I have a young staff. So I have one that's getting ready to have a baby. I have one that just experienced her first Christmas with her little one. And I, well, two of them. And then I have one just coming off maternity break who was in that emotional state of leaving her baby for the first time. So um, we, (laughs) we, yeah, it was wonderful to see, um, be able to just pop in and say hello and offer my service to, you know, all of them. And um, it was quiet. It was a quiet day. And I know they got a lot of work done. And we're going to actually start with self-reflection first thing in the morning. So I'm excited. I sent them a little video to kind of gear up for tomorrow. Um, PD, I'm going to definitely connect it um, to this brain aligned relational discipline. I'm not going to throw it all at them right now. But first, we're going to talk about, you know, what is our our own, what, what, how do we view ourselves and the people, the key people that are in our life, how do they view us or how more importantly, do we want them to view us? So we're going to dump in, jump in, not dump, jump in (laughs) to self-reflection first thing in the morning. So I'm looking forward to that. And then students back on Wednesday. That's exciting. And I can't wait to see their faces as well. Um, And then doing that mental catalog of all the things that I think I know and understand about some of the things that might've happened to them over break. Mm -hmm. and how we are placing um, resources, people, um, and materials in their path right from the very beginning, right from the the very moment that they enter our door um, to make sure that they have a good, successful start to a second semester. Yeah, not all breaks are good breaks. So, Absolutely. And I think that really is a good segue into this Mm -hmm. framework that we've been discussing over the last couple of episodes because it's really about everything that you do it's not a program. It's not a systematic approach to um, addressing targeted behaviors, right? It's a way of being within your building. Something we want uh, to develop within them. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So tell me, you said, you mentioned that tomorrow, um, and I'll share a little bit about our PD. I think we're going after um, educator brain states a little bit differently um, for our first round, but you're a little bit in a a different place in the process of putting the framework into your building than I am at this point. This is only my second year. And of course, last year was pretty unusual. We were out by March. Right. (laughs) It was lonely until August. So talk to me a little bit about um, your first or your initial approaches with chapter two and your staff. So what jumps out really is the emotional um, contagion. So we all know that our kids are going to take on our emotions. So this chapter, um, really dives deep in looking at our own brain states and making sure that we are in that calm moment um, and able to regulate ourselves so we can co-regulate kids. And so um, one of the biggest things that I am going to hopefully facilitate tomorrow is the fact that um, that relationship piece is the cornerstone of this whole new discipline thinking um, and making sure that we are connecting with kids and that we understand that we are the ones in charge of it all. There's, I mean, behavior management is adults. And so making sure that um, we jump in with that. And again, we've, I've said it, I think every week, 
not everyone is, is reflective. Um, so it is difficult. Everybody's going to be in a different state. So I'm going to offer the opportunity for them to be very reflective and to write personally in their journal, but also for a walk and talk as well. So if they feel compelled at the end to, to grab someone maybe not so familiar with them, um, to make a connection for, for peer to peer, right? But also just to be able to get it out. But not everybody will, and that's okay. And I fully understand that. But um, we have to know that they're coming off of, I want to say it's like a reset of secondary trauma, like with all the COVID stuff and all the emotional stress that I saw when they left. I think they're going to be clear when they walk in. I think it's going to be a great opportunity to just capture that self-care and continue that as we move forward with kids before kids come in. Yeah. I love that idea. And I, I was thinking about, as you were just talking, that um, what she talks about so much, it's one of the best descriptions of the teaching process. She talks about how teaching is organic, mm -hmm. how um, that process is organic and that schools are living systems. Yeah. Meaning that you can't, as they grow and they change and they flourish, then the way that our brains and our mind adapt have, have to adapt has to change as well. And I think that, that that's key in understanding this. I had a really smart human really early in my career named Dr. Uh, Randy Weishart. And one of the things that he said to me, and I'll never forget it, um, and not to me, but I think during one of our classes, was that teaching is not brain surgery. He said it's harder. It's mm -hmm. infinitely more complicated than mapping the human brain because of the complexity of the adults and the complexity, obviously, of the kiddos. Right. Um, so I really appreciate your approach to that. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to look at the framework a little differently. So I'm going to rely heavily on a book that was introduced to me by my first director um, when I became a principal, Dr. Corey Hartley. And he offered up um, this book called Leadership 2.0. Mm -hmm. And it really, I think my initial response to that was like, why am I doing this? Um, but I found after I had uh, honestly and deliberately identified my five strengths that I was able to be more evaluative. I don't think I would have said brain state at the time. Right. But now after the years of training and the time that I spent with Dr. Day Sattel, um, and in this discipline, I would say my brain state. So we're going to approach tomorrow um, by looking at our five strengths and identifying those strengths and identifying how we interact with each other based on those strengths. So one of the things that's always super funny to most of the people that know me um, until they've delved deeply into what this means is my number one is restorative. I don't necessarily come across as a restorative person in nature. <laughs> but, you know, what drives me um, often and part of my brain state is I have an overriding need to feel like wherever I've been is better as a result of my presence. Mm -hmm. And while that sounds a little bit arrogant at your from your first sweep, Behind it is this need or this push or this drive that burns in my belly constantly to make sure that I'm providing the opportunities for things to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that starting that conversation with our staff tomorrow leads us more into individual brain states and a way of being and interacting with each other mm -hmm. that allows us to tap into um, each other more often as resources. So that's kind of where we're heading tomorrow based on, and I was very reflective about that with my leadership team um, moving into this day and into this semester based on the framework and the study that we've been doing with this book. Now, I know this is only your second year there. Did you do that? I did that my second year with my eight step team. Yep. Did you do that with your eight step team last year or is this a first for all of you? This is the first year that I've done it in this building as right. a leader in this building. I did it in my former building. Yeah. Um, and I found that we did a very good job the first year of identifying our strengths and having conversations about our brain states based on our strengths. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of went away. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, we stopped talking about things in relationship to, I understand that what you're saying to me comes from a restorative place or a belief place or mm -hmm. whatever your strength is that it molded and morphed into more of what we're talking about here in this framework with the brain states. And right. so that's kind of the perspective that we're moving on. Good. Yeah. We did that with our ASAP team a couple of years ago and it helps when you're sitting across the table and they know that I am belief and I need someone with discipline that will 
give it to me straight because I want to always save the kids, right? Save them all. But on the, on the backside of that, the consequences and the conversations that have to happen in the restorative piece is there too. So they have to understand there is a line there. And I tend to lean more towards the lovey dovey side. You know that about me. So always leading with love. Yeah, I never noticed. <laughs> what? All you, need is love. All you need is love. Oh, I'm hey, just love. You know what? I do wonder though, and I, I thought about this too in relationship to it, when I go back to this chapter. Th- number one, I guess I should have started by saying I felt this chapter was really overwhelming because there was so much in it. I feel like that this is probably at least the third time I've read it. The first time, very closely. Probably the other two times more of like skimming it, like going back and looking at things, questions I had posed for myself within the text. Um, And so I wonder what role we are thinking about. Like, I think we're both talking about modeling, correct? Right. And modeling the our brain state. And so how, how are we moving forward with that in our staff? What are some of the ways that you're using? And I was thinking specifically about when she goes into, um, she's very specific, starting on page 49, to school leaders mm-hmm. and school leaders modeling brain state. So how, where are you going with that? Well, so we, we have this every day is morning meeting. So every day is modeling some type of what she calls a, a focus attention practice and trying to be very deliberate in telling teachers that this is a time for you too. It's not just about you teaching the kids how to regulate themselves. It's also about you taking on, um, you know, whether it's the belly breathing or the deep dive or um, the, I do it all the time while I'm talking right now, massaging my fingers or the tapping, you know, something that allows them to, um, to practice that. So I do a lesson, you know, there's a group of us, there's three of us that cycle through and we do lessons for the entire building and making sure that those are in front of teachers um, via video and they can go back and they're archived and they can watch them whenever they want to. Um, I don't think that we're there yet as far as being able to talk about our brain state. So that's kind of where I need to move into. We're good with kids. I need to get better with adults. Um, But I think that, you know, we have to get past that mind. We're not just there for the test score. We're not just there for the content. And that is a mind shift. And I think we've done a really good job of um, getting most of the people shifted, but there are still some that, um, I I don't want to say buy-in, but it is of whether this, you know, whether the brain align activities and the deep breathing and the yoga that we do, I've done restorative yoga with my staff twice. And every time they've walked away, you know, the ones that were apprehensive were like, man, I really needed that. And I didn't know I needed it. So taking care of your adults by modeling things that you want them um, or hopefully they can take on on their own independent practices. We're, ju- we're going to journal tomorrow. I journal. That works for me. Again, that might not work for everybody. What are you doing? Well, you know, I think I'm, I'm in this place. We, we do have weekly um, SEL lessons. So we talk about this not being, you know, a program that we're mm-hmm. thinking about it in relationship to. Um, it being a practice, a way of doing, a way of being. SEL lessons are a way for us to connect to kids. I think right now we have very much modeled it and um, kind of supported it in relationship to us teaching kids. And so I think the Mm. impact on educators right now is not there. I don't think it's there yet because it Mm -hmm. becomes a conversation of how um, we then move that into adults. I think that big piece is vulnerability and mm. that idea of making yourself vulnerable as a leader. And I got to tell you, like, I do have these moments of, you know, you feel like you kind of get into this leadership trap at times. And one of those traps is that you not only do you have to have all the answers, which is laughable at best, but not only do you have to have all the answers, but you also can't show that kind of emotional connection in ways that are proactive or productive. So acknowledging your dysregulation or acknowledging ways in which you're regulating yourself, I think sometimes by some people can be seen um, or perceived as like a sign of weakness. Weakness. Mm -hmm. I would actually argue that it's probably a sign of real strength in terms of being brave enough and thoughtful enough about making yourself vulnerable. So I think right now for us, it's really about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I, and and being vulnerable as a leadership team, my principal, my vice principal, uh, me and my vice principal, our vice principal, 
showing that and talking about our brain states. I do hear, and I think I mentioned this in um, the last podcast, I do hear that language around it more often. Mm -hmm. That idea of not just accepting the fact that I'm dysregulated, but also my ability to move forward in accepting it and then doing something with the dysregulation. Mm -hmm. I hear people more often using language that talks about their dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that feels like a moment where we start to push people forward with, I've acknowledged it. Now, what's the next step after acknowledgement? How Mm -hmm. do I move through it? and buy it and pass it. And I think one of the bigger challenges for all of us is then making the time for our faculty to be able to do that. If we acknowledge dysregulation, then we have to allow for time to become regulated. And that doesn't always happen in a nice, neat 47 minute class period with four minute passing periods. Right. Just absolutely does not. And so how we build time into our day to make that happen as well. I think my favorite thing lately is I have a trampoline in my class or in my office. And obviously I bought it for kids, but my favorite thing is when I peek in and I see a teacher in there and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I just needed a minute. That's exactly what it's for. I need, I mean, I wish I had more space in my building. We have a sensory room, but I wish I had more space for an adult sensory room because um, there's sometimes where they just need to go into a room and shut the door and and just chill. And there, are, I know there are places that they can find that to get that breath and um, to be able to do that 90 second countdown or whatever their whatever strategy they're going to use. But it's exciting for me for for that language um, to be repeated back to me. I'm in my hot brain. I just need a minute. And that's perfect. I do. And, and we're hearing we're hearing hot brains. I'm hearing hot brains more often. I'm hearing the words dysregulation more often. Mm-hmm. And I'm here. I'm seeing people at least it, it, rudimentally rudimentarily. I can't even say that they're attempting on a very simple plane, a very simple level, to to do some of the things that would help them to regulate. The deep breathing, you mentioned that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Steph on 53, 54 of this. Mm-hmm. Peer support, space mm-hmm. for reflection, calming sounds, deep dive breath, energizing breath, all of those things. I think the real winner, winner, chicken dinner on this deal is the minute that you walk into a classroom and you hear and you you see a teacher talking about their dysregulation mm-hmm. and modeling for kids how they're getting through that dysregulation. Mm-hmm. That's the framework, right? right? That's the, it's not just like you mentioned, it's not just the morning meeting anymore. That morning meeting has evolved and moved to all of those moments that she describes um, specifically in chapter two as a way of being as mm-hmm. opposed to the thing that you have to do. Right. Um, and I think that's it an awful lot. And I really, I, I think she did a really, I, I really love the story of June in this chapter because I think that was the point of June. It was just as much about, it was completely about the evolution of the adult, the adult change in brain state to support June, to make June more successful. She was not perfect though, right? Which is the other piece of this piece, uh, the other piece of this conversation that can be difficult sometimes for us. Yeah, but being human and being vulnerable and being able to say to a student, I'm sorry, I raised my voice or I'm sorry, I didn't give you a chance to process. Hearing those words is just going to build that connection with our most difficult students um, and, and, and staff, you know, same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's if there's a moment um, that, you know, there's been a short conversation or maybe a, a, a difficult conversation because those have to happen um, if if you're leading, there's going to be difficult conversations happen. And after that, being able to continue to move that relationship forward, um, Mm -hmm. you know, with those restorative conversations, but also I understand how you're feeling and listening during those conversations too. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can be, and I I liked how she described it as, you know, we, and and I love this. Maybe I mentioned this in the last one and I'm sorry if I did Sometimes I forget. I'm getting really old. I'm almost 50, but it's so true. But I, you know, I, I read this thing the other day about stop calling teachers heroes. Oh, yeah. Like, like stop saying, like, I, I feel, and this came from um, one of the, somebody that I really respect in, in the, the education field, stop calling me a hero. Stop calling us heroes. Because really what that indicates or what that screams is that we have to do these superhuman things. Mm-hmm. And I love that Dr. V, she doesn't say it in those words, but she says that we have often neglected our inner selves, right? Our own, our own. And we don't need to get deep. I don't need to know about your own personal trauma from when you were six. And I don't need you to share how many aces you've had. 
we're talking about that deep look into what it means to be part of this teaching life, to be in classrooms, mm -hmm. to do the mm -hmm. things that you just mentioned, the, the mm -hmm. secondary trauma pieces. Um, and I will, I will be the first to admit, as somebody that's been in this field for 25 years, six just in a leadership role, that I have completely neglected my inner self, my professional inner self. Mm -hmm. I've neglected to acknowledge how six years of experiencing high poverty schools mm -hmm. and the things that have happened to our kids in addition to knowing and understanding the things that have happened to the adults that I serve mm -hmm. has impacted me too. And, and I, I, I think that that's the vulnerability piece. Saying that out loud is uncomfortable for me yeah. because I think we believe we're just, and teachers too, not just principals, mm -hmm. that we're just supposed to do it. We're just supposed to take it on. Mm -hmm. That's just our job. And if we signed up for the job, then we signed up for the inner turmoil and, and all the other things. Oh, I remember my first year like running to the bathroom as fast as I could because the t I could just feel the tears coming after one of our first, um, just one of our heartbreaking, you, you see it every day, um, just the heartbreaking uh, situations. And and then I just looked and I'm like, if I'm not strong, who's, who's going to be the strong one? And so you put that face on as much as you can, but now I'm learning, I can't, I can't live in that state all the time. They have to see when I'm upset or you know, when I'm frustrated and being able to, you know, be vocal with that. So it's not about being perfect in front of them as a leader. It's about being real and about being, and I, and I think I'm, I think I'm, that's one of my strong suits is that I, I have that ability to self-reflect and to be able to do that. Um, one of her quotes that I really liked was that the vital difference between a good teacher and a superior teacher is the one who self self-reflects. So that's, that's big. So Let's just be vulnerable. Is there a time you want to share that you, you were in your hot brain with, with a teacher, well, with a student, or, or in I a situation? I, I think I would just share that despite the reflection and despite the, the study and despite the, the dedication over the last couple of years, that I still, I mean, I still find myself. I found myself very much in my hot brain before Christmas break, responding to a very, very difficult situation involving multiple kiddos. And... It was, it was almost, I think, over a period, and I hate to admit it, but over a period of two or three days to pull myself out of that whenever I had to connect to or have a conversation about what had occurred within the building or what it, and, and, not, and it's nothing like first shatteringly horrible. I'm not announcing something like that. I'm just saying, you know, and I think my reaction to it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so when I was able to reflect, and again, it took me two or three days, I was, I was, I'm. I'm good enough now to say to people, I am not going to discuss this today. I'm not going to, because I don't, we don't have to, the people that need to be safe are safe, the, the, everything that needs to be done is done. But in order to move forward, let's, let's talk about this at a later time. I think that was my piece of it in, in terms of stepping back and being more reflective. And I think it really came down to everything that we just talked about, that vulnerability, right? Acknowledging that my reaction to that situation was also acknowledging that I am often despite all of the things that we know and understand, completely helpless in situations. There are things that I can never change for kids. There are things that I can never change about the situations that they come to me in, and they will have an impact on the things that they do in our building. And it sometimes is just super sad. Mm -hmm. And that that kind of now is what puts me into my brain state. How about you? Yeah, you know, I was just, I think sometimes going into the leadership position, one of the hardest things for me was to not say something. When you see something and sometimes instead of getting in my hot brain or spouting out, I would kind of draw inward and process maybe too long of what to say to that adult or that student in that moment. And so that comes with experience too. Um, but I, I found myself that was on the opposite end. I've, I feel like I can stay out of my hot brain when I'm around people, but it's sometimes, you know, that belief, I'm going to believe that that person's going to do the right thing when I walk away. And sometimes that's not always the case. So I think for me, it became more of being able to have those difficult conversations over the last five years of saying things when you see something that is not okay. And I'm not talking about like yelling at kids or anything like that, but it's just the small things. And um, sometimes it's hard for others to see those small things. So it's about how do you have those conversations when you don't think you're wrong? And I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm trying to open your eyes to the bigger picture. Um, and I tend to be very perfunctory in nature. So it's, it's, this thing isn't done. 
do it. <laughs> it's oh, not, I learned my lesson that way. Sending it, emails. That's, my, that's not me being in a bad brain state. There's just there's just not a lot of reason to talk about it. Here's this thing, and we're gonna do it. <laughs> oh, thank goodness I have yeah, a great. About that. Uh, I have a great relationship with my my union people because I'll send it. I you know at that the beginning I would send those compliance emails and yeah. they'd come to me and say, Kirsten just a conversation let's just have a conversation about it because you do you you have to find that balance of when i say something that you have to follow through and you have to be fair and you have to make sure that that's you know follow through is there but again that's my whole learning how to lead people is you know that email can be taken out of context and can be taken with any tone that you read it with so it is important more important to have that conversation instead through an email so i learned that you know, you don't just become immediately vulnerable. Moving from one building to mm -hmm. another building in just the last year, I can tell you that 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 movement from you know you don't just immediately have it. It just takes a lot of time to create relationships. It took mm -hmm. a long time for me to be thoughtful about how I was going to introduce this framework, the way that I was going to talk about Dr. Day to tell, and the way that I was going to talk about my brain state with staff um, because. You know, like any human being, those, like you've said, those relationship pieces are key. Right. So what are your takeaways? I think we're coming in on our 30 minutes. Yep. What are your takeaways? Are we close? What are your takeaways? What are some of the things that we would want to challenge people to do as a result of uh, having read chapter two? I Number one, I would challenge people to read it multiple times. Mm -hmm. There's and a lot. I'm not like you. I'm not a big journaler. Like, I don't write a lot to write. Sometimes I write over to the side. I do... I, I leave. I don't leave every day until I've written out just a few reflective statements because that's the only way I ever come back and, and get better. If I don't do those things, then I'm never going to change anything I'm doing wrong. But I don't know. What are your What are your biggest suggestions or takeaways if somebody was looking at chapter two for the first time? So I think the biggest thing is how our staff, how adults, talk respectively to our kids in that moment of crisis. So how do we do that? Um, I think part of doing that is making sure they understand that um, they need to elevate their own sense of purpose. Why are they teachers? You know, maybe being reflective of why they are in that position. That gets a little bit deep. Um, but then again, is your is your emotional state worth catching? I think that's the big thing. So tomorrow during our conversation in the morning, we're we're going to talk about it, it's your you know we're I'm taking one of the leader in me activities. And it's your 80th birthday and your key role players that have been in your life this entire time. What are they going to say about you at your 80th birthday? Because I think that's important. Um, I want, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm portraying myself. I want to live to the core of where I am. Um, I'm very spiritual and I want to make sure that that's out there. But I don't know. I'm kind of stumbling over my words here. But I think the biggest thing is that they... Um, they take away that their perspective of themselves is just as important of what other people think about them. And they're in charge of that. They're absolutely in charge of that. Just like they're in charge of the, the environment, the culture within their classroom, they own it. They are the ones that can. They're, yeah. They're in charge of that. And it's worth exploring for them. Like it's right. worth their time because of the way that it makes them feel and the way that it makes all of the humans that they impact around them feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the piece of it. That's, that's the struggle mm -hmm. um, is that that vulnerability is worth the time and the effort because mm -hmm. in the end, the way you feel as a result of that is important. If I had not made myself vulnerable with the, the staff that I worked with at star mm -hmm. through that first year, that was very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And even through some of the challenges and changes that we've had, since I moved to test, I think that vulnerability and that honesty is something that's helped us build and forge relationships. Right. We didn't have to have bad things happen in order for relationships to be built. Mm -mm. We just had to have moments of vulnerability and clarity that we were willing to share with mm -hmm. each other to help that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that piece of it, that realization as a leader has been key. And that's, I would go to, and, and I thought about this as you were talking, like you, you talked about that 80th birthday. Right. I love the letter that she wrote to pre-service educators mm. and to all new student educators. I think that was the point of that exactly. Right. Um, I, I wish somebody had told me, I wish I knew then what I know now. Mm -hmm. And here's why thinking about your own brain state and the framework um, 
for you and within your classroom is going to be so critical and so important. Mm -hmm. But I would just, I would just say to anybody, like read that chapter more than once and really read it and really think about what the point of, of your brain state is mm -hmm. um, and your relationship to it. But I don't know. I enjoyed chapter two, but I think we talked about it before we started today. This one was really hard. Like this, this was a lot. Well, you have to be vulnerable to be vulnerable, right? Like it's, it's just one of those things where, yes, it is. And, but the resources that are in here are amazing. And so if you don't have the book, here's my little, make sure that you go get the book. <laughs> but I, I mean, the things that are in here as strategies that she just provides, um, it breaks it down into very small chunks and, um, it's, it, it makes sense. And it just gives you those models for how to, how to meet students in that regulation moment when you're feeling away or when students are feeling away. So, um, I really value the resources that are in here as well. And she, um, quotes Mona Delahook as well. And I love, I love her stuff. So, um, I like that everything just kind of meshes together when you're talking about the brain and relationships and, and how and kids you work. Go, you can go anytime to the revelations and education site right. that, um, that she had, where she has unbelievable amounts of resources, including a lot of these that are updated and posted for, for your use. We'll put and it down. I'll put it down in the link to the bio. We'll put it in. We'll put it down here. If I did that right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it well, is 730. It's 730 and we have school tomorrow. Yeah, so it's probably it's bedtime. time for bed. It is time. Because that's how we take care of ourselves <laughs> when we get back to our first week. Right. Well, so with your computer, yeah, you too. Join us next Monday. Okay. Have a good night. See ya.